I'm a scholar of violence. In fact, I teach in a center that deals with violence, wars, and terrorism. But today, today I want to talk to you about love and hope. I want to argue that love and hope are intricately tied and that they're critical for the future of our world. Now I know that some of you in the audience might be thinking, oh geez, this is, this is going to be a soppy talk like, talk, like some Disney movie or some John Lennon song. But why is that? Why is it that it's more fashionable to talk about violence and wars than it is to talk about love and hope? So why this silence? Now, I don't need to tell you how love feels. You've all loved somebody or something. But what is love in essence? Well, I argue that love and hope are manifestations of human agency. Human agency, as you might know, is a sense of autonomy and self-determination, a sense of sovereignty over your thoughts and actions. It's a sense of choice, empowerment, self-determination. And what's interesting about human agency is that it is a part of human essence. Love and hope, I argue, are the most potent manifestations of human agency. Why? Well, because love makes you feel fully alive. It makes you feel exhilarated, intoxicated, metaphorically speaking. And hope, hope is intricately tied to a desire to love. I mean, you don't fall in love with someone only after you know that they're in love with you too. You fall in love, you take a leap of faith, you hope against hope that's going to work out. And that's as true for romantic love as it is for, um, for other kinds of love, like love for um, fellow human beings. Now, I want to come back to this issue of love for fellow human beings, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about agency. Philosophers argue that agency is critical to our existence, and that in the absence of agency, we'd live an inauthentic existence comprised of thoughtless compliance and complicity with even the most brutal of all regimes. Here's what's very interesting about agency, is that while freedom assumes agency, Agency need not assume freedom. In fact, I argue that some of the most powerful and dramatic manifestations of agency take place in the absence of freedom. Take, for example, resistance movements. Auschwitz, for example. There are numerous stories narrated by survivors of Auschwitz that detail various forms of resistance movements that took place in this Nazi death camp and other Nazi death camps. They range anywhere from a desire to want to escape to wanting to sabotage a mass execution that the Nazis had planned. There is a very emotional story narrated by one of the survivors of Auschwitz that I'd like to share with you today. It's a story about a woman called Mala. Mala was a Jewess from Belgium. Mala had dared to fall in love with a fellow inmate. They'd both dared to fall in love and they'd both dared to escape Auschwitz. Imagine, in the middle of this ugliness and monstrosity, Mala and her lover focused on love and hope. Unfortunately, as with most cases of, most such cases, they were both caught and they were both scheduled to die. Minutes before Mala's execution, while her SS commandant was engaging in this rhetorical speech about the futility of resistance and escape, Mala slits her wrists and kills herself. Imagine, killing yourselves minutes before you were scheduled to die anyway. This 
ladies and gentlemen, is the most dramatic manifestation of agency without freedom. It was Mala's way of saying to her SS commandants that while they may control her physical being, they do not control her essence, that in essence, she was still free, even if that freedom meant choosing the timing of her death. Take the example of hunger strikers in prisons. Bobby Sands, member of the Irish Republican Army, became the poster child of the hunger strikers in the 1980s. He and nine others engaged in a hunger strike to demonstrate to their captors that while they cannot determine when and if they may be freed, they had one sense of choice still left for, to them. And it was a choice not to eat. And again, agency in the absence of freedom. Take the example of self-immolation. Muhammad Bawazuzi catalyzed the Arab Spring in 2011 when he set himself on fire as a way to protest the Tunisian government's oppression and injustices. Bawazuzi had very little freedom in, freedoms in his life due to his political and economic circumstances. But he had one freedom still left to him, one sense of control, and that was to choose the method and, again, timing of his death. So you can see that Agency is a very powerful and central desire for, for human existence. And as I said before, love and hope are some of the most potent manifestations because love makes us feel fully alive and hope is intricately tied to the decision to love. And as I said, this is as true for romantic love as it is for other forms of love. Love for fellow human beings, for example. Now, I don't mean that in some warm and fuzzy way of holding hands and swaying together. When I talk about love for fellow human beings, I'm talking about a love for fellow human beings in the real sense, on the ground level, so to say. For example, imagine that you're walking in a street and you notice yourself coming, walking toward a stranger. You notice that this stranger looks sad. Now, you don't know why they're sad or what their situation is, but you decide to smile at them. You smile with your eyes in, the way, in a way to give them into some sense of hope, some sense of shared humanity, solidarity, acceptance. That's love for fellow human beings. And you know what? You may never know just what that smile meant to them. Volunteering in a hospital with terminally ill patients. That's love for fellow human beings. Now, you may not change the world, but you certainly change the world of the person with whom you spent a few hours with. For those few hours, you gave this person hope. For those few hours, that person was fully alive. Witnessing a hate crime about to happen and intervening to stop that, despite the fact that you know that you will never be the target of that hate crime, is love for fellow human beings. And this love for fellow human beings is based on agency. It's based on a choice. Now, to be sure, hate is also agency. It is, after all, a choice for those who choose it. And for those who choose hate, it makes them feel empowered, in control. But I argue that hate doesn't make you feel as exhilarated as love and hope. Why? Well, because hate comes from a place of anger, resentment, fear, hopelessness. Where is love? Well, love, love comes from a place of acceptance, understanding, Tolerance, hope. Hope is everything. Some years ago, I lost a job at a university that I was teaching at in, in the United States. This was at a time when the country was going through one of the worst economic recessions. Things looked bleak. I was devastated. Now, I know that we all lose our jobs at some point in our lives. No big deal, right? Well, this was a big deal. 
This was a big deal because at the time, a lot of personal plans were contingent on a two-income household that were suddenly called into question. What was also called into question was the logic of writing or continuing to write a book that I was writing at the time. It just seemed futile to be focusing on intellectuality when the more pressing needs of food, shelter, job were knocking on my door. But I held on to hope. I mean, I went on the job market, but I held on to hope that if I can finish this book, maybe better things would come for me. I finished the book, the book got published. A few months after the book was published, I was offered a position as visiting lecturer at Princeton University. A few years after that, I was offered this position here at NTU. Holding on to hope is everything. But what's the larger significance of hope for our world? Well, I think that if we come from a place of hope, we can dare to think critically. We can dare to challenge the norms that have thus far only led to the action reaction of violence, wars, and terrorism. We can imagine, dare to imagine a different world. What I'm really saying, what I'm really saying is that if each one of you, particularly the young folks in the audience, if you can come from a place of hope right now, right here, then when later you're in positions of power as teachers, professors, government officials, policymakers, scientists, you can take this perspective with you. You can dare to question the way the older generation did things. You can dare to question the norms that thus far only led to perpetual wars. You can imagine a world that's based instead on reconciliation, acceptance, tolerance. Now, I'm not saying that it's easy to hold on to hope. It, it most certainly is not. Not in the world that we live in today. What I am saying is that our only hope is to hold on to hope. But here's the thing about love and hope as based on agency. They're not unlike any other actions based on agency. That is, there are no guarantees. There are no guarantees that the outcomes will be as you expected. The outcomes might be better than you expected or worse than you expected or somewhere in between. But you know what? There is one guarantee that if you take no action, there will be no outcomes, negative or positive. Psychologists say that we are the authors of our own lives through the actions that we take or don't take. Well, I say that we are also the authors of our own world through the actions that we take or don't take, through the hope that we hold on to or don't. We can write rewrite the story of this world. We can rewrite the story by holding on to love for fellow human beings and hope for a better world. So I just want to leave you with a few questions today. And I want you to really think about these few questions. Do you think that our world is worth the risk of love and hope? Do you think that you are worth the risk of love and hope? Do you think that your children are worth the risk of love for fellow human beings in the hopes for a better world? Are they? Well, I say absolutely yes. Yes, yes, they're worth it. We are worth it. Thank you.